Okay, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Can you read it? Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the, the circumcision, they done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its co commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. The title of today's message is Destroy the Barrier. Destroy the Barrier. So Paul, uh, he was talking about the unit in Jesus Christ here in Ephesians. And he showed two great examples who were the enemies before, but became friends. Even become, became one body. Everyone loves unity, isn't it? But not everyone has the spirit of unity. And everyone speaks about unity too, but not everyone works for this. Because having unity is not easy at all, isn't it? And it requires hard work and a humble mind. And sometimes it needs to sacrifice your own interest too. So today I want to share about the unity. So how the early church was united despite of all the differences regardless of the you know, culture or skin color or social status and language. So I really hope that in our Gracia Church, we have a unity. We have a strong unity under one name, Jesus Christ. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at one by one. So Paul is drawing of the vivid contrast between the life of a Gentile and Jewish. Okay. These two groups of people were so much different in many ways. So if you look verse 11, Therefore remember that formerly you were you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. The, the first difference between them was physically. Physically they were different. So the Gentiles were called the uncircumcised, which is done in, you know, in, their, in their body and it was made by the human hands. So this was the greatest, first of the great divisions between them. Uncircumcised and the one who circumcised in their body. Last time, you know, two weeks ago in my sermon, I explained how the Jewish despised and hate the Gentiles. In their eyes, Gentiles are disgusting people, in a simple way, you know, in simply speaking. They say that the Gentiles were created by God to be the fear for the fires of hell. The Jews believed that God loved only Israel of all nations that he had made. And it was 
not even lawful to help Gentile woman in their in her childbirth, for that would be bringing another Gentile into the world. The barrier between Jew, Jewish and the Gentiles were so you know so much, so absolute. If a Jewish man married to a Gentile woman, they have uh, they have the funeral for the Gen for the Jewish man. Because marrying to a Gentile woman means death. Right? So even go to a you know, Gentile house, it makes the Jewish unclean. And that much difference. So can you find any relationship in these days worse than this relationship of, you know, between these two, Jewish and Gentile? Can you find any of the relationship in these days worse than them? So I couldn't find any of it, really, isn't it? So our society, I can say they're much better compared to them, but if you look at deeply, you're going to find it. There is the same hostility. There is the same wars and barriers between all of us. Okay. Let's look at this. So not, the first one is physically they are different. And the second, verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope, without God in the world. Second difference is their mentality and the view of life is different. The Gentiles had no hope of a Messiah, which is the Christ and Savior. So the Gentiles were without God, without, without Christ, while the Jewish never doubt that Messiah would come even their hardest time. And then the result of the difference is so huge. For the Jew history, uh, there was always going somewhere. You know? This is their viewpoint of the history. No matter what happens, no matter what the present was like, future, the future was glorious. Because they believed God. God will bring them to the better place. In, on the other hand, the Gentiles, the view of the history and the life was essentially, you know, uh, very pessimistic because their history was cyclic, repeat. They believed that it went for, you know, 3,000 years and then came a destruction, that the whole universe was consumed in fire. And after that, after that, the whole process began all over again. Yeah. The same event, the same people repeat themselves. That's, the, that's their life view. That's, the, that's the, you know, the way how they look at the world, the history, and their life. The repeat, the cycle. The Jewish, they look at their life as more you know, going further, going to somewhere the place where God is going to lead us. Optimistic. Future, there's a future, there's a progress. So their mindset, their viewpoint, viewpoint was very different. There's no God, there's no hope in Gentiles. So Paul continued on this. They were foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. There was no hope because there was no God, right? while Jewish had always had a radiant hope in God. That's the, that's the very different things. Just like, you know, met Mark, Brother Mark, you know, prayed in the opening prayer. We came to church to seek for the hope, true hope that never disappeared. The true hope you know, never based on the false promise. We are looking for the hope. God is leading us to a better place. Tomorrow will be better than today. Next year is better than this year. That's the hope that we have in God. God is bringing us to the brighter future. That's the hope that we have. So here we say, we already have seen how the Jews hate and despised the Gentiles. And then how Gentiles, 
Then how are the Gentiles toward Israel, the Jewish? In the same way. They hate them. Gentiles hate and despise the Jewish as much as the Jewish hate and despise them, isn't it? I, before I shared one, one of my experiences while I was in China, you know, I, I you know, found a you know, wallet, wallet on the street. And then uh, you know, I found a man you know, who was belonging to them. And then you know, it was a Japanese guy. And I called him and oh, I called him, you know, I found your wallet. You know, come and you know, pick this up. And we met together. And then, you know, because he was very thankful because I you know, found uh, his wallet. And I asked him a question. You know, I actually, you know, before that, I never you know, speak to you know, Jap Japanese guy before. And then, you know, from this instance, I asked him one question. You know, I have one question to you, you know. Why Japanese, you know, dislike Korean, you know. We have, you know, <laughs> the kind of relationship, you know. And then, you know, for as of Korean, I think I have a reasonable reason. Because, you know, back then there was a war. Korea was colonized by Japan. And then, uh, you know, there was cruel, you know, colonization. So... I thought, you know, Koreans are the victims, right? <laughs> and then they don't have any reason to hate us. But why do they hate us? So I asked him this question, and then the answer was really great. He said, you know, because I, we hate Koreans is because they hate us. <laughs> because we know that Koreans don't like Japanese. So we don't like Koreans, you know? I think after hearing this, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Think about this. If anyone, you know anybody doesn't like you, <coughs> would you like him? No. Right. If I know someone doesn't like me, eventually, you know, from my heart, I keep the distance. And then I'm not going to like him. Right. That's, the, that's the reasonable things in our head. In our head. But what it says in the Bible, really, there's a, it's really big, the big barriers among us. There's a big barriers among us. Just like the Jewish and Gentiles, that we have the big barriers between us. Like, you know, just like Koreans and Japanese. But here he keeps saying that in chapter 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. You too. There's so much distance, but He brought us together as a one body. So think about how can we bring together, how can you are brought together? It's because by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. There is. There's the wall of the hostility between us, between them. And then, the peace was made because Jesus is the peace. And then the peace is won at the price of his blood on the cross. The cross, on the cross, all the sins of the world was what was, was, uh, was washed away, and all our sins were cleaned. He took all the heads on his shoulder, he took all the blames that we have to each other. He took every blame and then sins on his shirt and died on the cross. Here, the barriers, the barriers. If you look at these barriers, actually it gives us a vivid picture from the temple, the wars between us. In Israel temple, there was, there was you no know, series of the different courts. The first is the court of the Gentile. The second, the second is court of the woman. The next is the court of the Israel. The next one is the court of the priest. 
and the final court is the holy place. So each you know, court, there's a divine, you know, there's a dividing wall between them. And then if Gentile want to go to the further court, it's prohibited. It is written clearly on the stone that if Gentile go to you know, proceed to the further step, it means it's you know, responsible for his own death. The woman cannot go further because there is a war between them. So there is a visible war between, you know, based on their social status. If you are Gentile, if you are a woman, if you are a priest, or if you are just you know, Israel, they have a certain place that where they can go, only just limitation. They cannot go further. So there is a, there's a dividing war made with stone. Nobody can destroy that. But think about this here. What Paul said, the war was de destroyed. It. Nobody, nobody could cross over the war because it's death, right? It means death. But Jesus, he destroyed by his, by his sacrifice. Two enemies, how can they become one? Uh, there's a lawsuit many times, right? Two parties have argued, had a discontentment, and then they brought this issue, you know, law case, to the judge. They found many you known things, you know, arguments based on their document, based on their papers. But it's really hard to bring a peace. How? Then think about how they can have a peace by the one, both, by the someone whom they know both, by the someone whom they love both. He come and talk to them. Right? Then there's a chance they can be, have a peace. So through the one, through the some, through the one that you know, both of them know, they can brought together. And there's a peace. So that's why you know, he's saying, Jesus, whom we love, the people who love Jesus Christ, we can come together and we can have peace in us through the one, through the one whom they both love. In Jesus Christ, through him, we can be one. All the barriers can be destroyed. And verse 15. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. Those making peace by abolishing the law and all the commandments and regulations. What does it mean? The Jews believe that only by keeping the law, by keeping the Jewish law, they can be a good man and able to attain to the friendship and fellowship of God. The law had been worked out into thousands and thousands of commandments and regulations. There are very specific regulations on every matter. Hands had to be washed in a certain way, even dishes you know, washed, had to be cleaned in a certain way. There was page after page about what could and could not be done on Sabbath day. The only people who fully kept the Jewish law were the Pharisees. But the problem is, there were only 6,000 Pharisees you know, back then. What does it mean? The only 6,000 people were the righteous men in the, in the eyes of God. Only they are the worthy people who can live. But Paul said in Romans chapter 10, Christ is the end of the law. Jesus ended legalism, and in its place, he put love to God and love to man. There was a story about a war in France. Some soldiers brought a dead body. 
which is the, their fellow to a French cemetery to bury him. And the priest of the priest you know, of the church told them gently that he needs to ask if he was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. And they said, we don't know. We don't know that. Then the priest said that he was you know, very sorry, but in that case, he could not allow to bury him in his churchyard. Right? So according to the church law. So the soldiers took the bad, you know, dead fellow body outside of the church, and they buried him. They buried you know, his fellow soldier. And the next day, they came to, you know, came back to see that the grave was all right. But out of their surprise, they couldn't find the grave. They searched everywhere. They couldn't find it. And they were you know, about to leave. And then the priest came and told the soldiers, you know, I was very troubled last night because I refused to allow you guys to bury him in my churchyard. So I woke up early morning, and I used my hand to put out all the fences, and then in order to include the grave into the churchyard. It was outside before, but he moved the fence so that he can exclude the grave in the churchyard. Regulations, think about this, orders, liturgy, Right. Everything really shoot us out from the presence of God. But love, love can move us, bring us back to the inside of the, you know, God's history. The rules and regulations put up the fence. But love really can move that. Jesus removed the fences between men and men by abolishing all religious religions founded on rules and regulations and brought to men a religion whose foundation is true love. That is how the Gentile and the Jewish came with a new unity in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two those making peace. One out of, one man out of the two. New kind man. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. What does he mean? Paul said that he made both Jew and Gentile into one new man. He says that Jesus brings us together, the Jew and Gentile, and from then, both one new kind of person is made. This is something like this. It's not that the Jesus makes all the Jew into the Gentiles or makes the Gentile into the Jew, right? But he said he's, he produces a new kind of person out of two. New kind of person. Just like, you know, it's like as it is, you know, as if melting down a statue of you know, silver and a statue of lead, and then the two come out of gold, come out gold. It's a new kind. He creates a new kind. When you know, Western missionaries went to China for mission work, the missionaries wore Chinese clothes. They eat, they ate Chinese food, they grow the, you know, the hair, right? The tail. They need the tail. And then, you know, he was, think about it, he was neither Western, you know, Westerner, nor Chinese. It's a new kind of man. <laughs> I think, you no, know, it's a new kind of man. And then the oneness, think about it, the oneness, what made them one is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Right? Not based on liturgy. Not based on religion, not based on skin colors or language, but based on the love that comes from God. Right? So I'm really, you know, when I prepared this message, I was thinking about our church. We have many different people, right? Many different kinds of people. I have Korean, 
Chinese, uh, Hispanic, you know, Hispanic and uh, African American and white, right? Caucasians. We all we have all different colors. We all, all have different culture. We all have different you know, cult, you know, language as well. But we became one body. We became, you know, one, you know, into a one new kind in Jesus Christ. Isn't it? One body. Verse 16, he says, verse 16. And it is one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hospitality. In this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hospitality. Jesus reconciled both to God. The word reconciled was used to mean that bringing together friends who have been against each other. So the work of Jesus is to show all men that God is their friend. So that therefore, they must be friends with each other. Reconciliation. Reconciliation with God involves reconciliation with man. Verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Foreigners and aliens. What they longing for the most is home. It's household. The feeling of belonging. As a foreigner, they would be regarded with suspicion and dislike in foreign land. An alien is like, you know, just like a residence alien, a man who had taken up the residence in a place but who never become a naturalized citizen. He paid a tax to the country, but the country is not his own. It means residence, alien. When I passed the naturalized test, obtained American citizenship, there was a big gathering in a city hall in San Francisco. And then, you know, the people in the ceremony were immigrants, just like me. Right? And all became, you know, American citizens that day. They were so happy, so happy that they, some cried, <laughs> some danced, and then they threw a party. And then when I look at them, I was a little bit sad, you know why? <laughs> that day I was a little bit sad. My husband so happy. <laughs> Well, I was kind of sad. I never you know, told my husband why. Why I was sad? Because, you know, before I was full, fully Korean, right? <laughs> Just belong to one country. <laughs> but I, right now, I need to, to serve two nations, right? So I felt like I'm less loyal to my own country, <laughs> that kind of feeling, right? But, you know, think about this. And I look at them, so happy, I thought. They must be, you know, went through. They must went through so much difficulties in the new land. Isn't it? You know, when my, you know, father-in-law uh, met me in the first time, he told me two things. Then May, <laughs> you need to remember two things when you live here. The first thing is, you cannot trust anybody. <laughs> Second thing is, you cannot lend money to anybody. <laughs> Really, because they were, they were, you know, they started, they are from China, uh, they were from, you know, Taiwan, right? You see China. And they were from Taiwan and studied in abroad, and they, you know, they found a job, and then new immigrants, the first generation. They went through many, many difficulties in the new land. Think about this. So they experienced. The new immigrants, they were cheated, right? They were deceived, they lost money, all things happened. So that's the, they're, that's, they learned from their experience. No land, to mon no money to anybody. Don't trust anybody except your family members. Isn't it? You must heard these same things from your parents. They think this is smart. That's the smart things to live. But when I think, oh, 
kind of sad, isn't it? That's the foolish things in my eyes, in our eyes. You need to trust someone in order to begin a relationship. Right? You need to trust somebody before they trust you even in order to start a new relationship with someone. If you don't trust, no relationship can start. Even if you be fooled, you dare to open yourself. Right? I think that's the, that's the teachings from the Bible. I'm so grateful to our church because you know, even though you know, I came from Korea and I was very new to this land, but you know, I was in church. I never felt that I'm a foreigner in church. They, you know, we are, we are all brothers and sisters. There are many you know, different people, but I was accepted immediately into their family. I think that's the greatest thing. Foreigners, think of here, he said, you are the foreigners, the aliens before. Outside of the God's history, outside of God's house. But right now you are welcome into the, you're brought into the family of God. We are the one family in God. God's family, in God's family. The feeling of the foreigners is outcast. You cannot belong to them. That's the feeling of the foreigners, the aliens. Right? Around the Thanksgiving season, right. it's a very you know, famous story. All of you know, well you know, known. A man walking on the street. It was Thanksgiving night. Right. He was looking, you know, walking on the street, and he saw a family. Through the open window, he saw family members you know, gathered around the table or around the fire, right? They have a fellowship together. But they, you know, shut the curtains down. The feeling of left alone. Outside of the you know, family. That's the feeling of the foreigners and aliens. He was left in the darkness. Paul said that. That is what we were before. But now you became the family of God. Through Jesus, there's a what? There is a place for all men in the family of God. Men may put up their barriers. Churches may keep their communion tables for their members, but God never, God never does. There is no barriers. There is no discrimination. The second picture that Paul uses is, the, is that of the building. building. Here, 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone of the building. You think of every church is the part of a great building, and in the whole church building, the cornerstone is Christ Jesus. And then the cornerstone is what holds everything together. Right? Think of a great cathedral. There are all kinds of architectures, right? the windows, the doors and the decorations of all are very different. But the building is one unity. Because through it all, it has been used for the worship of God and for meeting with Jesus Christ. In the in Catholic Church, if you look at the Catholic Church, there's mosaic windows, right? Mosaic. Different shapes, different colors. But when they were, they were put together, they reveal great images, beautiful, beautiful images right, of one unity. Really, church is some, somewhere like this. Church is the building. This church is you not know, all members can be united. It's not that just you know building with in you know, the made with bricks, made with stones. But we are the member of the church. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. This is what the church should be like. Its unity comes not from the organizations, nor rituals, or liturgy. It comes from Christ. Where Christ is, there is the church. The church is the, the body of Jesus Christ. All members are taking part of it. The church is not a place to propaganda, but to 
provide a home where the Spirit of Christ can dwell and where all men who love Christ can meet in that Spirit. In Him, verse 21, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. It's not already completed. The building is not already completed, but it's being built together. We are not perfect. We have many, many flaws. As we not have more members increased, they might have more problems happen, isn't it? But it doesn't matter to us if we are in Jesus Christ. There's just one spirit, just one spirit. We dwell, become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. All together is being built together. We help each other unite each other and encourage each other. We love each other. I really hope that in our church every member can you know, leave the true unity. All the invisible barriers can be gone because of Jesus Christ. Right? I'm so glad and I'm so thankful that you know, we have many different kinds of people in our church. Even though very small, think about it. our church, people ask me, your church is Korean church? And I evangelize on the street, they ask me, is it a Korean church? I said, no. We have many different types of people, many different kinds of people. We have, you know, right, right? I said, even though small, I really hope that our church can represent the beautiful body of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear gracious Lord, thank you so much. We were strangers before. We were far away from you. But through Jesus Christ, you brought us together in one place and made us one unity. Father, we are all different with different colors, different language, different culture, different personality. But nothing matters to be one because we have Jesus Christ here. Father, we ask you to continue to guide each member to grow so that all can remember that through your sacrifice, all our barriers and wars were torn down. Men make barriers with their pride. But Father, Jesus, he tore down all the, all the barriers that we had made with a humble love. Father, please, let your humble spirit always dwell in us so that we live in peace and love. Thank you so much. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.